Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and Black's Myth, issue number one. Trade paperback just dropped, but I'm just now reading about issue one right now, so it is what it is. Uh, I really like the title of this, Black's Myth, because Blacksmith, when you say it out loud, it's like, oh, I see what they're doing there. I like that, a little play on words. This is an Ahoy Comics. Uh, I'm going to talk more about them because I'm a huge fan of what Ahoy Comics does, more than just what they've done. I like what they do. I'm going to explain all that. Uh, Eric Palicki is the writer. The artist, meaning pencils and inks, is Wendell Cavalcanti. I say that because there's no colorist. This is a black and white comic. Rob Steen does the letters, and it's created by Palicki and uh, Cavalcanti. There's also a, a, a main cover by uh, Liana Kangas, and Jamal Agal does the variant cover, as Jamal does a lot of the variant covers. Um, he's just got that art style. I think the number one comic that these guys actually have at Ahoy Comics is um, uh, Dragonfly and Dragonfly Man. Uh, fantastic stories. Uh, of, it's almost like a reverse uh, isekai kind of story, if I'm pronouncing that right where the main characters are actually from a different universe and they're coming into our universe, so to speak. And in reality, it's a little bit different than that it's reversed of, of even that, where they're kind of, it's two different versions of the same character changing where they're at. So yeah, they, they have to play, they, they have to play by the other people's rules while still being themselves. You know, it's, it's interesting and they're trying to figure this out and it's all based off of a Batman esque kind of thing. Their other main comic is, um, uh, uh, Mark Russell, uh, Richard Pace, and Leonard Kirk. And I can never remember the name of this freaking comic book. It's a good comic book, but I can never remember the name of it. It's the one where the Superman type character and Jesus hang out with each other, right? The, the, the Jesus returns comic book. The name's like right on the tip of my tongue, but it, for, I don't know what it is. With my brain, it's such a hard name to remember the name of this comic book. Anyway, even when I was interviewing them, I forgot the name of the freaking comic book, which just killed me. Um, Anyway, so Eric Palicki has done some work before. I, I was on Twitter having a very minor conversation with him before. And uh, so, of course, you know, Twitter's going to be like, Professor Bill, you're never on Twitter. So you were just talking with this person before. Here's some tweets by this person. And it's good. It worked out really good that way because I saw he was advertising that he just has this trade paperback out. I'm like, all right, cool. So for this issue, issue number one of Black's Myth, he... Listen, the previous story that I'd read by him, and I read them, I read all the issues and I really liked it. I just, I'm not going to do the final issue or two, you know, review for the guy, but I did do the first several issues as a review for the guy. Um, not for the guy, for you guys, really, because I did want you to see, and it, it's only going to benefit him, I imagine, because it was a really good book. I kept reading it because it really was a good story. Um, more than that, it was an ingenious concept. Ahoy Comics, I like them because they don't just try and find good comic books or just publish any old crap. You know, oh, you pay us, we'll put your stuff out there. There's there's some independent comic book companies that are out there. But very few comic companies, especially independent comic companies, who don't have legacy characters and legacy environments, right? You can jump into a Captain America comic book or a Batman comic book because you know the characters. You know all the characters. Even if they introduce a new 20 characters in there, they're still gonna there's still gonna be Batman and the Bat family and the villains there. There's still gonna be all the stuff that you already know. There's gonna be Gotham City, so the world that you know, right? The DC universe. Superman can fly overhead at any moment and it'll be pissed because you stay out of my my city, right? Like we know the world. So we can always jump into a DC or a Marvel comic book like that. A brand new character? No worries. We can jump right into that. Most other comic book companies can't do that. But Ahoy Comic Books does. Not that they have an integrated, integrated universe, but it's more like they have a certain style that they propagate, that they promote in their company. They don't just pick any old person and say, yeah, sure, come along and do your freaking comic book. Let's see what you got. No, it's more like, let me see what you got. And let me see if it's worth publishing under our banner. We might, you know, just recommend that you go someplace else. We might have to give you a rejection letter. Um, go figure, right? But they've got a certain style. And that's cool. That's important because Image Comic Books actually doesn't. 
And while they'll have certain books like The Walking Dead, you know, where you're going to get into those characters, you're going to love the, you know, the Rick Grimes, the Michonne characters and whatnot. Um, that's something that I expect to see fairly soon if uh, Eric Palicki ever starts doing longer than six issue, four issue, whatever runs, right? I expect to see him being able to do that with his characters because he does make believable characters. He didn't do it in one particular case in here. And I'm going to, I'm going to criticize that harshly, but he usually does that. He'll, he'll have characters who are believable, who you can follow, who you'll, you'll know their quirks. You know what I'm saying? The, the little kinks that they have in their system and the, and the, 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 just the kind of way that their swagger and everything, right? So, uh, with Atlantis wasn't built for tourists, he had something that was cliche and something that was mostly very different, or at least unfamiliar to most people and excitable to people who were even familiar with it. Case in point, he had vampires in there, right? And everybody knows what a vampire is. My kids, six and eight years old, they've never read a freaking Dracula or vampire story in their lives, but they know what a freaking vampire is, you know, from Hotel Transylvania or whatever. It's integrated so deeply in our culture. But he also had Cthulhu Mythos in there, namely the Shadow Over Innsmouth, um, one of those characters in there, which was shocking and very welcome. I'm extremely familiar with those stories. I love those stories, you know? I'll read them, I'll listen to them on audiobook, um, uh, often, audiobook, you know, often, you know, like sometimes once a month, I'll listen to some of the, you know, H.P. Lovecraft or, or just sit down and read some of his short stories, you know? But any of those old weird tale stories for the most part, but um, to see one of these characters in here, one of these Innsmouth characters, was really refreshing. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who've never read H.P. Lovecraft who are like, holy crap! And yes, I know he's a racist. It doesn't change the fact that he still had some brilliant stories. Um, what do you call it? As far as this story is concerned, he's got some of the familiar. He's got a werewolf character, and she's a very blasé character. And, and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to just have a basic voice that you can put yourself in her place and see things from her eyes. Um, but there are actually two main characters in here. There are two characters who we see from their eyes and they jump back and forth. Um, I don't know that Paliki has that style down. It's, it's, and it's the hardest writing style to ever get down. So make no mistake. Um, Frank Herbert wrote Dune where they're like 20, 15, 10 different characters at the same time, and you're jumping back and forth between each of their heads, each of their thoughts. You're in the minds, hearing the thoughts that they're having. Like, here's Mohayim, you know, Gaimides, whatever her name is, the Reverend Mother. And then we're listening to Paul. Then we're listening to Paul's mother. And then back to the Reverend Mother, and like bouncing back and forth all over the place, you know? And you're, you're hearing everybody's thoughts. And, and very rarely does stuff like that work. Some people are even famous for not being able to make that work like Virginia Woolf, right? But Paliki's trying it here. We're bouncing back and forth between two characters. I hope that he can, I hope that later on in the story, he's gotten a better grasp, a firmer grasp of that, but it's a very hard thing to do. And I have to respect the bravery to do what is literally the hardest thing to do in writing. Uh, so nice. I, I hope that he was able to pull it off by the end. And this first issue, yeah, you know, no complaints, but no praise. Just, it is what it is. Um, he's, besides that vampire, or excuse me, that uh, werewolf character, he's also got a jinn character, more specifically a half jinn. Now, all my travels to the Middle East, bro, I could tell you a thousand jinn stories. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Maybe not a thousand. Okay, so I'm exaggerating a little bit. But I can tell you dozens, legit dozens of jinn stories, right? The jinn are just, whoo, plethora. In, in the Middle East, you know, Saudi Arabia specifically, right? Sitting in the desert talking to a bunch of your boys about jinn stories. Thousand and One Arabian Nights has nothing on these stories, you know? And the idea of a male and a female jinn, uh, a, 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 a male and a female, one from the jinn world, one from the human world, falling in love with each other and then having offspring, that happens a lot. Very rarely do we actually get the story of the child, right? Like a damp fear, half vampire, half human. Here's a half jinn, half human character. And we're getting the story of this character. This is the character I actually want to focus on. This is the character who kind of, there's a weakness here. There's a moment where the, the, the werewolf girl is shot, 
buy a silver bullet, and she just pops that thing out like it's a freaking zit. And that shouldn't be the case. And she heals so rapidly from that. Next day, she's fine. Keeps on hearing, uh, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm gonna, in the beginning of the story, I kept on thinking she's going to die because because she said, I'm dying. I'm, I didn't realize this was the day I was going to die. She says all these things. Next day, oh, no, I'm fine. Well, the what? I remember when I first started writing, or actually later than when I first started writing, I did write, you know, so tired, so tired, so tired, so tired, so tired. And everybody who's criticizing the book is literally saying, dude, you can't have this guy being this freaking tired and he doesn't sleep. Like, people die. I'm like, well, when I was in the military, I was always tired, but then we still had the mission and we had to move on. It's like, okay, well, then write it better because this just feels, you're telling me that the guy needs to sleep now or he's going to pass out. And he doesn't. So he obviously wasn't that tired, right? Maybe he's superhuman or whatever. And it's like, I get it. Okay, you're right. I get it. I screwed up. And I did. In this particular case, character didn't die, but she said she was going to. Break. She's talking to the guy, and she's got a very blasé voice, which, cool, you can get behind that. There's a comment in here about the guy having a, um, uh, a Manchester... Well, being from Manchester, but he doesn't have the accent. There are two words in here where he says, me mate. You tried to assassinate me mate instead of my friend, me mate. It's two words in one word bubble in the whole entire thing. There was a big deal made, and I actually liked the big deal that was being made. You're establishing who this character is in a very cool way, and probably making a bunch of British people, you know, English people, UK people, very happy. That you're pointing out, not all freaking England English people have been to, or God forbid, are from, or know what it's like in London, right? If you're American, have you been to Washington, D.C.? Most people are going to say no. Most people are going to say they haven't even been to New York City, for crying out loud. And that's a must-see, you know, location. Tourists will come over to freaking Georgia and be like, you've never been to New York City? No, I haven't, bitch. What's your problem? Yeah. Right? Likewise, <laughs> most Canadians haven't been to freaking Ottawa, you know what I'm saying? Uh, or Toronto, even, for that matter. So not every English person has been to, or God forbid, is from or knows what it's like in London. So I appreciate that, and I'm sure a lot of other people appreciate that too, but you only have his voice doing a me-mate once in the entire comic book. What was the point of establishing his British? What was the point? It was it was waste. It's like Chekhov's gun. It's a complete waste of comic book space, panel space, to have them establish that he's from Manchester if that's not something that's going to matter in this issue specifically. And it could have simply been further established by having his voice sound like that. When you're writing a novel, any editor worth their salt will tell you, I need you to pretend. First off, I need you to not put in so many he said, she said. I don't care how you do it. He exclaimed. She cried. Um, you know, the screamed so-and-so. It's still all just a variant of he said, she said. No. What I want is for you to not have to put that all the time. And I don't care if it means you're italicizing some words and bold-facing the others. I want to know that I don't want to know when John is talking. I want to know when Jane is talking. Not just by what they're talking about, but how they're talking. That is so crucial when you are writing a novel. How much more so when you're writing a comic book where there are pictures of people, right? I don't think it would have hurt to try and get the English accent down just a little bit more, right? But there was literally two words in one word bubble in this entire comic book that established him being, through his voice, through his own voice, that he actually had a British accent. So that was a huge, huge misstep as far as I can see, as far as the writing style is concerned. It's forgivable, but there was absolutely zero point. In this issue, there was zero point in doing such a thing. Um, aside from that, I'm going to make one other complaint in the exact same vein because it's it's similar. The main bad guy in here seems to be fascists or white supremacists. They actually use the word Nazi in this, but they also use white supremacist. First off, it's cliche. Nowadays, it's so cliched. It's almost, 
And it's okay to make a political or otherwise statement, a religious statement if you want, in a comic book. It's fine. But it's upon you to hide it, right? To put it in there, but to make it subtle. That somebody can pick up on it, but not prove a damn thing, right? So you say, oh, if that's the way you interpret the book, so be it. But when you just come right out and say, oh, uh, my enemy is a white supremacist group. Oh, really? So, so, uh, Nazis? Yeah, Nazis. In between all that, I just said that it's cliche nowadays to have it that racist white people are the, uh, the main bad guy. Tell me how they went on to explain what a white supremacist is in this comic book that actually happened. If I had to make one damning statement about this comic book only, that would be the one that I would plant my flag on. You use a cliche thing that you've got to know is going to piss off some of your potential audience because of how ridiculously cliche it is. Like, nobody else can be racist. Um... And you didn't have to make them white supremacists or Nazis to begin with. You could have just said that they were anti-superhuman or supernatural, right? You could have made them witch hunters for crying out loud. You could have done anything and just made them really bad people. You could have done anything, but you just had to do this cliche thing. And on top of that, this cliche thing that anybody could point out and say, oh, that's white supremacy right there. You felt the need to explain it. That's the big wah, wah, wah kind of moment in this book where I just looked at it and I'm like, just keep reading, Bill. Maybe it'll get better. And it did. The book was good. I liked some of the things they did in here. There's a thing that's been used in here that was used recently in Marvel, a Ghost Rider story specifically. Um, if I choose to review issue number two or anything else in here, then I'll talk about it. But for now, I'm not going to spoil it because uh, it is worth reading this comic book. And just like with the English accent thing, the Manchester specifically accent in here, it was only mentioned once and then it was reinforced once. Here, the white supremacy thing was mentioned once. It wasn't even reinforced at any moment here. It was just a quick one and done kind of thing. You'll read about it for like two or three panels and then it'll never bring it up again, thank God. And you just move on from there. Um, yeah, so that was that was very, very helpful to move on. But there's some things, just reconsider who your bad guys are, right? Don't make it cliche. It, it's too much. The familiar and the unfamiliar with the heroes in here, absolutely perfect. It was masterful. I loved it. But man, there's some times. Anyway, guys, that's going to be, oh, that's not actually it for me. Let me also talk about Contactless. Um, this is a short story that it, it was one page of just text and there's a quick illustration on it. It's a story that could have gone the creepy locked up in the basement way or the, oh, this guy's actually pretty good way. They went with the latter, not the former. I like that. And then the seal was actually a, a really decent story. You know the old story of, oh, yeah, look, here's this guy who's, you know, driving down the road, an old dirt road, a country road, and it's foggy night. And he sees this woman and says, hey, can I give you a lift? Yeah, I just live down there. And he's driving. It's like, oh, yeah, I was out looking for my fiancé. I lost him, you know, some time ago. Uh, I lost him, like, yesterday, and I was looking for him. Well, I hope you find him. And she said, okay, cool, let me out right here. And he says, you sure? I can't say anything. Don't worry, my house is, or my home is right over there. So she gets out and leaves, and he drives away. Next day, he's looking through the newspaper, and he sees a picture of her and says, what? And it's in the eulogy section, whatever, the dead people thing. These people die. The obituaries. There we go. Why do you have the word bitch in, in dead people thing? Like, how rude is that, right? Anyway, the obituaries. And they go and they, you know, it just looks like, it's like left behind a, a fiance and blah, 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 but she died two nights ago. That's impossible. I just saw her. So he drives down there on a clear, sunny day and, oh, it's a graveyard where I dropped her off. Oh my God, that's crazy. I had a ghost in my car. Yeah, that thing. That's what this story was. It wasn't that story, but it was in that exact vein, that, in that you know, genre. So I'm going to tell you this. If you wanted to get this comic book just for that story, it would be worth it. It really would. Because you're going to want to, I imagine, a guy who loves camping all the time, 
you're gonna and, and, and reads to my kids and tells them stories all the time. You're gonna want to have one of those kinds of stories available to tell your kids, right? Something maybe not so dare we say cliche when we were talking about this comic book, something a little bit different. And I really liked this one. It wasn't great by any stretch of the imagination. Even saying it was good was like, you know, okay, but good in a certain context. This story has been told in so many different ways before, but seeing it told in this and just not realizing that's what it was going to be, and then suddenly realizing it and then wondering, how are they going to end it? It was very tongue-in-cheek fun the way that it was ended and it's a short story right two-page short story pretty good anyway guys that was this book uh blacksmith <laughs> love that uh, i would recommend grabbing this book and seeing how it tickles your fancy and moving forward with it like i said paliki has a way of making believable characters making fun characters I hope he kind of shies away from the whole, you know, cliche villain guys, especially ones that are that are clearly going to be controversial in the day that you're. It's it's hard enough writing something that in that will hold up in the future, right? Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer also, but especially to especially Huckleberry Finn, right? It was the great American novel, which with Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer both taught. Don't be racist. If you're a racist, bad things are going to happen to you. And black people deserve to be free. And it was a, there were wonderful stories, but the N word was used. So right away, people who can't think past the nose on their face. In fact, if their brains were dynamite, they couldn't blow their nose off. They right away say, eh, it says the N word seven times in that book. It's a racist book. You are stupid. You! You are to fit! It's hard enough to get books to stand up to modern day ideals. Don't make a book that's going to be controversial in a very simple way to not do that in its own day. Don't do that. Never do that. It's not worth it. You're trying to make money. When you become a great, like Eric Palicki will one day wind up writing possibly the great American novel. You never know, all right? But he will go on, will go on to do really amazing work that's going to be memorable, right? One of the things that I hope that he's going to figure out at some point is don't be purposely controversial until you have the clout to do it. That's important. Anyway. That's going to be it for me. Guys, enjoy. I do still recommend this book. It, it's literally one thing. It's just an annoying thing. It was annoying, annoyingly easy to just ignore completely. Could have taken that out. Wouldn't have been nothing. A quick fix. Nothing. Tweak of the screwdriver. Not even a full twist. Anyway, guys, that's it for me. I'm leaving. Like the freaking video. Watch a freaking ad. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.